Hi, welcome to Your Finance TV. We're here with Jeffrey Huge, founder at Alpha Insights. Jeff published his weekly piece on Sunday evening, which can be found on Substack at hugeinsights.substack.com. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe to Your Finance TV. The buttons are right there and there and wherever they are. Um, but make sure you do so you don't miss any of our content. Jeff, always to uh, always good having you on the show. And you're looking fantastic. I feel very underdressed right now. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Yeah, I had to suit up today for another occasion, but uh, you know, not that I wouldn't suit up for you. <laughs> I was about to say, I'm like, I, I not only do I feel underdressed, but I feel quite honoured that you dressed up for me. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll take I'll take the remnants of the the special occasion. <laughs> so, Jeff, as always, um, let's dive right in. There's always lots to talk about. Um, you publish your piece. Um, let's go top down as usual. Yeah, you know, uh, the S&P was up a little less than a percent last week, and uh, it was an extremely low volume rally, uh, very narrow in terms of um, uh, participation. We did see some sector rotation, you know, big earnings out of the banks, uh, you know, kind of uh, led the financials back from the depths of despair, despite the fact that they're still down uh, significantly from uh, you know, say their February highs, uh, not to mention their all-time highs. Um, you know, as we've said, banks are in a bear market and uh, you're going to get, you know, some rips. Uh, you want to sell those rips whenever possible. Uh, this week, you know, um, coming into the week after, you know, looking at the data on Friday's close, you know, we feel like uh, sentiment has kind of reached an interim peak here. And uh, we think that, you know, Breadth continues to be exceptionally narrow. Valuations, you know, at, at the top decile, which puts a cap on the upside. And the setup that we see in the S&P 500 is maybe the most bearish we've seen since January of 2022. That being said, uh, we've got a lot of earnings coming out this week. Um, all eyes are going to be on Netflix and Tesla, of course, why I don't know these, you know, our companies are like one, one and a quarter percent of the S&P 500. They continue to be thought of as being kind of market leaders. Um, you know, we're getting a bit of a recovery in, in um, uh, Netflix off the lows. But, you know, Tesla looks to me like it's in a great position to short. We have recommended shorting the stock. We're not recommending it specifically today in our research note. But, you know, this is a name that we don't want to own. Uh, but it is a name that is reporting and it's going to have a big impact on the market. Um, obviously, we want us to pay attention to everything coming out of the financial sector here. Uh, you know, Goldman Sachs this morning, uh, WIFT, uh, they uh, posted a $470 million uh, reserve that they had to take for their Marcus MasterCard, uh, the deal that they did with Apple. Um, you know, it looks like people aren't making their payments. And uh, that is a problem. I had a conversation with a guy this morning who, you know, thought credit card uh, receivables were a great place to invest. And yeah, maybe if you're buying the short duration AAA American Express, you know, you probably are going to be okay, but you're getting a negative spread to three month treasuries on that paper and a longer duration. I just don't see the point, uh, you know, of, of taking that risk when we're on what I believe to be the precipice of a recession. So, you know, with that, we continue to recommend our investors uh, minimize net equity exposure, maximize cash reserves, uh, you know, enjoy the safety and, and um, you know, uh, relaxation of being able to own three month T-bills with a 5.21% yield today. Uh, and just enjoy the fireworks, right? Sit back and wait. You're not going to miss it. Trust me. Sit back and watch the fireworks. Well, you know, <clears throat> thanks for that uh, recap, and we'll we'll unpackage more as as the show develops. But um, you know, this week's piece, you dive right in, and you have that you know the, the gauge there, the fear and uh, fear and greed index gauge, and and it seems like we're sitting quite firmly in that you know greed zone. Um, what are your thoughts about this? Well, you know, um, the index closed last week at 67, but it hit 70 yesterday. You know, above 75 is extreme greed. Um, I think looking back a year ago, we were at, you know, in the 20s somewhere. Um, so, you know, kind of we've gone full circle in terms of investor sentiment. And, you know, um, the chart at the, in the lower panel kind of shows the ebb and flow 
of the fear and greed index over the course of the past year. And you can see we're now in, you know, kind of that, that top decile of, uh, of um, greed readings at this point. And, and while we haven't hit extreme greed, it's not a requirement, right? It's just showing that there's complacency in the market at this point. There's really just no fear is the point. Uh, people are willing to put risk on uh, without any sort of, uh, you know, with reckless abandon to some extent. And so, um, you know, our, our thinking at this point is this is getting close to a major turning point. And, you know, we've outlined it in other areas of the, of the note. Jeff, we um we spoke about it off air actually a little bit on uh, the market breadth and how narrow it is. Can you talk us through yeah. this? Well, we've been talking about um, you know market breadth a lot in our work lately, and um, I guess the reason for that is because it's so important. You know, since the February second high, um, only the Fang Index, the Nasdaq one hundred, and the S and P one hundred are in positive territory. All the other major indexes, be it um, the S&P 500, the S&P equal weight, um, the uh, Wilshire 5000, the broadest measure of the stock market, um, the mid cap 400, uh, the uh, small cap 600, the Russell 2000, uh, the financials, obviously all deeply negative since the February 2nd high. Yet there are people out on in, in financial media talking about a new bull market. Uh, I'm sorry, even the equal weight uh, NASDAQ 100 is negative since February uh, 2nd through yesterday's close. And so, um, you know, I put it to you this way. Uh, financials are still down 28%, even with a huge rally last Friday on JP Morgan's blowout earnings, which basically just beat a massively reduced estimate. Um, you know, SMID caps across the board down 10%. Um, you know, it just looks um, like there's very low participation. It's a handful of stocks. It's the top seven market cap stocks in the NASDAQ 100, in the S&P 500. These seven stocks are 51% of the NASDAQ 100 and 26% of the S&P 500. And their valuations today are more extreme than they were at the peak of the market in January of 2022. That does paint quite the scary picture. Um, and also now let's have a look at this chart in regards to the bearish setup. And, and you know, you're referencing January 22, but this is, uh, this is pointing to, you know, as you say, an extreme bearish setup here. Yeah, well, uh, let me put it to you this way. Um, it's the most bearish setup we've seen since August 16th, at the very least, possibly since January of 2022. Um, you know, the way I see it, the market's at the precipice of a third degree or the third wave decline at three degrees of trend. Uh, we clearly see um, interme or we clearly see a primary wave three decline underway right now, uh, possibly an intermediate wave three decline. And if that's the case, then a minor wave three decline. We'll know that for certain uh, once a couple of things happen. Number one, once we take out the March 24th low, uh, that would confirm without much you know, room for error that we're in minor wave three down of, um, uh, of uh, uh, intermediate wave three down. Once we take out the December 22nd low, that will confirm that we're in intermediate wave three of primary wave three down. And once we take out the October lows, that will confirm that primary wave three down is well underway. And so, you know, we've got these, these marks that we're going to see hit uh, to confirm this. Now, if we're wrong, um, obviously, we're going to take out that uh, February 2nd high, 4195 is the number. So far, we're holding below it. As long as we continue to hold below it, then the count is good. A um, couple other things I think people should be aware of. Number one, there's a few cycles in play. Um, the first cycle is that April 6th marked a, a minor Montgomery cycle turn date, okay? Um, April 20th will mark a major Montgomery cycle turn date. Now, what's the significance of this minor and major? Well, we think we've been in a minor advance, a minor wave advance off of say that, um, um, you know, March 13th low into perhaps today's high, right? And, and so that would be um, a minor wave cycle peaking 
and, and kind of transpiring into a major. So it's a minor to major cycle reversal, okay? And the next cycle will be to the downside. So we see this as a major cycle turn point from Paul McCray Montgomery's work. And, and you know how, how fond I am of his work. The guy was a brilliant uh, cycle uh, analyst and he made a 50 year career uh, that, that really made him a legend on Wall Street. And so using the same models that he used throughout his career, We've identified these dates, and we believe that these dates are probably very significant. Now, that being said, there's a second cycle that you can see kind of at the bottom of the chart, and that illustrates a 50-day cycle that's been in play uh, since the October 13th low, uh, really since the August 16th high, right? And so, you know, that 50-day cycle uh, looks like it's slated to bottom around on or about May 24th. If that comes into play and we get, you know, a meaningful top here this week and a hard down move into that uh, May 24th, that's the next month is going to be a brutal month for investors. And we think that the, the old um, traders maxim sell in May and go away is probably uh, germane to, uh, to this market environment. <clears throat> well, it's, it's, it's quite shocking seeing that on the chart when you overlay that 50-day cycle it's it's uh it's a very good representation of what we've been seeing i i like that chart um jeff you have uh you, you're referencing a uh, cycle degree elliott wave thesis can you talk us through this yeah it's real simple you know there's two possibilities here on the left hand side of the chart you can see our preferred count the preferred count suggests that the june low was the end of primary wave one down. The August high of last year was the end of primary wave two up. And that we've been subdividing uh, primary wave three down at intermediate and minor degrees since. So that would suggest that the decline into the October low was minor, or I'm sorry, was intermediate wave one of primary wave three down. And that the rally into the February 2nd high was intermediate wave two of primary wave three down. That means that the declines that we just saw into the March 13th low would be minor wave one of intermediate wave three of primary wave three. And the rally that may have ended today could be minor wave two. Minor wave two may have topped today at today's intraday high. And if that's the case, then we are at the precipice of a third of a third of a third wave decline that should prove many to be an epic plunge. It could carry the S&P down into the 2750 to 2400 range before it terminates. And that won't be the end of cycle wave A. We still have a fourth wave counter trend uh, advance, which is likely to be more of a lateral uh, consolidation move. And then a final plunge into what we believe will mark the bottom for cycle wave A down. And that's likely to be S&P 2250, which is a 61.8% retracement of the entire advance off the 2009 low. Now, if that's correct, then at that point, we should see a meaningful counter trend advance, which would be wave B of an ABC corrective waveform, which we think will be um, a super cycle degree wave four correction. Now, that's, that's the case that we've laid out as being kind of our preferred view. If we're wrong, if we take out the S&P 4195 level, then we would immediately shift to our alt view. The alt view basically suggests that the um, decline off the January 2022 high was a leading diagonal of the expanding diagonal uh, uh, category. And that was five waves down that ended October 13th. And so that everything since October 13th was uh, primary wave two. So the October 13th uh, low was primary wave one down. Uh, and then we're now seeing primary wave two unfold. And we think if this is, uh, if this is an operative count, it's probably a double zigzag and we probably have one more new high to go, which should be contained by the Fibonacci 61.8% retracement level of that primary wave one decline. And so that would bring us to about 43.12 on the S&P 500. That's as far as we think it would go. We give a little bit of flexibility, but if we were to hold above, say, 43.25, we'd have to rethink where we're at. 
Um, but I, I think that's a much lower probability. I'd say it's maybe like a 30% probability at this point. I put 70% probability weight on our preferred count. Ouch. So even if we do continue and extend, it still doesn't have that much uh, room to run. That's right. It doesn't. And, you know, we're talking maybe 150 S&P handles, right? But just looking at the cycle work, the timing of it doesn't lay out. I don't see any reason why we'd see a 150-point rally in the next two days. Yeah, understood. Um, Jeff, let's have a look at the S&P internals. They, uh, they don't seem to be holding up much hope, hope either. Internals have been weak. They continue to be weak. Um, we've been looking at uh, the S&P 500 cap weight from a momentum perspective. Historically, we've changed that this week in, in the presentation. You'll see that it's an unweighted version of the S&P. And I think it gives us a better measure of what's really going on in terms of the S&P 500's momentum. The average stock is barely above the median line in terms of momentum right now. And um, you know, my thinking at this point is, the cap weight index didn't have great momentum. It had okay momentum driven by the top cap weighted stocks, you know, as people really just kind of, you know, piled into those, um, you know, mega caps for safety. It was a flight to safety sort of trade to begin with. Um, but, you know, the thing that's really kind of caught our attention is the fact that the average stock isn't keeping up at all. Momentum has been very lackluster. And same with breadth. Breadth has been very lackluster. And same with net advancing volume. And if you take a look at all three of those, the one fact that jumps off the page is that they are all diverging negatively versus their January highs vis-a-vis -vis a recovery in equity prices to nearly match that February 2nd high. And so, you know, you would think, well, if, if price is going to take out its February 2nd high, then all these internals should be breaking out to new highs too. Not the case. Negative divergences oftentimes precede a major trend change. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the internals. Can we talk about volatility? We've, we've kind of touched on volatility for the last several weeks and, and months, and we, we've been expecting this volatility to rise. Um, it certainly hasn't risen, and, and it kind of feels like it's dropped off as well. Yeah, don't I feel like I've got egg on my face? Probably for the last three or four weeks, I've been saying, hey, volatility is toward a point where we would expect it to reverse. And we actually did get that big spike up uh, in mid-March, right? And it went to around 31%. It fell a little short of the previous highs. You know, in the past, 34% had kind of been, you know, kind of the level that we'd expect a spike to peter out at if it was just going to turn around and reverse. We didn't quite get there on this uh, event for some reason. There's lots of explanations for it. Um, but the most interesting thing, I think, is that last week, options expiration saw um, the front month VIX contract just utterly collapse. And the VIX itself closed out last Friday at uh, roughly 17% round numbers. That was the lowest close, weekly close that we saw in the VIX since the last week of December 2021, just days before the S&P 500 topped on January 4th, okay? So, you know, the chart that we're looking at shows a relationship over the past year that each and every time uh, the VIX has pushed up to about 34% or above, it's been in the neighborhood of marking a, a meaningful um, uh low in the market, right? And what we've seen on the flip side of that is every time the market or every time the VIX is broken below the 20% level, it has been in the neighborhood of marking a meaningful top in the S&P 500. Well, we are as low as we've been in the last year. And so if my calculations are correct, just based on this observed pattern, you know, we should be knocking on the door of an S&P 500 top on an interim basis here. And what would um, signal that to me from this model would be the model would have to move back above 20% on the VIX and also above its 21-day moving average. Typically, once you've gotten above that 21-day moving average, you never look back, you just keep going. And our suspicion is once that happens, it's going to be happening as this third of a third wave decline unfolds. And we should see an epic spike in the VIX itself. 
I suspect that spike will take out the 40% level, which we haven't printed in over two years now. And 40% was that level that we were discussing week in, week out. Right. It's kind of, it's right there, isn't it? It is. We'll see how it goes. Um, definitely keep an eye on the VIX. Um, looking at sectors. So last week it felt like there was a bit more of a a, a theme emerging on, on the defensives. Are we moving away from this, just judging by the sector movements this week? It's really been a, a game of ping pong from week to week uh, when it comes to you know, sector rotation. I mean, one week it's the defensives, the next week it's the cyclicals. Next week it's the defensives, next week it's the cyclicals. You know, last week you had big earnings uh, reports out of the major banks, uh, Citigroup, JP, Mor or, or JP Morgan, of course, uh, Wells Fargo. Um, I believe uh, uh, those were the kind of the primary suspects, right? Uh, maybe Morgan Stanley was another one, I believe, that reported. But, you know, uh, be that as it may, um, the point is that um, the bank earnings came in largely better than kind of the worst case that people had in mind, you know, since last month's, uh, you know, run on the bank in Silicon Valley, um, you know, earnings estimates have come down dramatically, right? Uh, and, and in fact, we can take a look back to just January 1st of this year, uh, 2023 estimates were at 230. We're now at 217, 218, I think 217 now for the year. And so, you know, we're looking for not a 5% year over year gain, but a 1% year over year decline in earnings across the board. Where did that come from? Well, two, two areas, really. It came largely from financials, okay, and tech, okay. So everybody's marked their estimates way, way down. And so they've lowered the bar. So we're going to hear things from CNBC announcers and they say, oh my gosh, JP Morgan beat. Well, what did they beat? They beat a vastly lower estimate than they would have had to beat on the first of the year, right? So um, did they really be, I don't you know, it, it, you, you can argue it one way or another, but um, I'm not impressed, put it that way. But the market was, the market was not disappointed. And as such, they, they ran financials up uh, pretty excessively uh, last week. And it was the best week we've seen in the financials, I think, uh, since the Silicon Valley Bank failure. And, and so that's great, you know, they're not dead, right? But at the end of the day, I think next week, it'll probably be the defensives. And so if I were to be positioning based on a sector rotation basis, this is what I'd be doing. I'd be looking at energy, number one. I'd be looking at uh, utilities, number two. I'd be looking at staples, number three. I'd be looking at healthcare, number four. And, and I would even throw some technology in there. If I had to pick a single name out of technology that I like right now, I would actually have to go with Microsoft. It's the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry basket right now. They got one thing going for them that I think nobody else can, can touch, and that's chat GPT. And I don't know what it really means for earnings, but it, it means um, they've got something, right, that nobody else has a competitive advantage for now. And, and people are willing to give them a lot of, um, you know, uh, benefit of the doubt, if you will. And so I don't care what their earnings are going to be when they report next week, uh, but whatever it is, um, the number's not going to be a disaster. And whatever it is, even if they miss, the stock's probably not going to get hit. And so I think that stock looks better than any other mega caps tech stock. And if that's got to be the hiding place that you choose, that would be the one that I would go with within that space. That being said, it's hugely overvalued and uh, trading at like 13 times sales. Um, and, you know, I, th I think on a PE to growth basis, maybe like three times or something. So, you know, you're not buying a cheap stock, know that in advance, but if you had to own one of those mega cap tech names, that'd be the one I would go with. Microsoft it is. So on to today's top tra actionable trade ideas. How do we make some money in this market, Jeff? Yeah, well, I, again, I think you got to stick with stocks that are working, as I always do. Stocks that are breaking out, making new 52-week highs are the ones that catch my attention. And by the way, Microsoft probably made a new 52-week high today. So um, that would be a reason I would uh, also put that on the buy list. But today, the one that I would highly recommend would be Lampus Holdings, LNTH. It's a small cap company trading $89 in the medical supplies uh, field. Um, stock. Uh, looks like it's breakout above $85, 
uh, clears a hurdle that could count a measured move up to 123. That's about 38% upside from where the stock closed out last night. Uh, we'd set our stop loss at $77. That sets up a nice three to one positive risk you and uh, you know protects capital on the downside if we're wrong. On the short side, there's a company called Amoresco, A-M-R-C, again, a small cap stock trading around 47 bucks. It's got a very discernible uh, classic pattern top formation of the head and shoulders variety. Stock has already broken its uh, longer term uptrend and is just dancing around the neckline of that pattern. A break below $43 would resolve the pattern to the downside and project a target of $10 on the stock. That'd be a 76% gain for a short seller uh, based on uh, the breakdown. And, uh, you know, we think that'd be a pretty good place to uh, put a short sale. Uh, if you own the stock, we would, we would, we would sell it. Uh, if you don't own it, you're a long only investor. It's an avoid. Okay. Uh, we'd set our stop loss at $50. That's, that's a very nice, uh, a positive risk view. I can't remember what the ratio is off the top of my head, but that's where you'd want to protect your capital. Well, certainly some uh, upside in both those names. Jeff, as always, I really want to thank you for sharing your thoughts from Alpha Insights. Always a pleasure. And uh, thank you out to our viewers, and I'd urge you to check out Jeff's content on Substack. It's uh, hugeinsights.substack.com. Until next time, good luck investing. <laughs>